This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 18. The Dictatorship at Work It achieved the complete mastery of the Bolsheviki over a country of 140 millions of population in the name of the proletarian dictatorship. One political organization, the Communist Party, became absolute ruler of Russia. The proletarian dictatorship was not a dictatorship by the proletariat. Millions of people cannot all be dictators, nor can thousands of party members all be dictators. By its very nat nature, a dictatorship is limited to a small number of persons. The less of them, the stronger and more unified the dictatorship. In actual practice, dictatorship is always in the hands of one person, the strong man, whose will compels the consent of its nominal co-dictators. It cannot be otherwise, and so it was with the Bolsheviki. The real dictator was neither the proletariat nor even the Communist Party. Theoretically, the power was held by the Central Committee of the Party, but actually was wielded by the inner circle of that committee, called the Political Bureau, or Politburo. But even the Politburo was not the real dictator, though its membership was less than a score. For in the Politburo, there were differing views on every important question, as there must be when there are many leads. The real dictator was the man whose influence secured the support of the majority of the Politburo. That man was Lenin, and it was he who was the real proletarian dictatorship, just as Mussolini, for instance and not the fascist party, is dictator in Italy. It was always the views and ideas of Lenin that were carried out, from the very inception of the Bolshevik party to the last day of Lenin's life, carried out when the entire committee was opposed to his opinion, and even when the Central Committee bitterly fought his proposals. On their first presentation, it was Lenin who always won. His will that prevailed. It was so in every critical period of Bolshevik history. It could not help being so, because dictatorship always means domination by the strongest personality, the supremacy of a single will. The whole history of the Communist Party, as that of every dictatorship, indisputably demonstrates this. Bolshevik writings themselves prove it. Here is sufficient to mention but a few of the most vital elements to substantiate my contention. In March 1917, when Lenin returned home from exile in Switzerland, the Central Committee of his party in Russia had decided to enter the coalition government formed after the abolition of the Tsarist regime. Lenin was opposed to cooperation with the bourgeois and Mensheviki who were in the government, yet notwithstanding that the party had already decided the question, and that Lenin was almost alone in his opposition, his influence carried. The Central Committee reversed itself and took up Lenin's position. Later, in July 1917, Lenin advocated for an immediate revolution against the Kerensky government. His proposal was roundly condemned, even by his nearest comrades and friends, as foolhardy and criminal. But again, Lenin won even at the cost of Zionev, Kamenev, and other influential Bolsheviki refusing to be parties to the scheme and resigning from the Central Committee. Incidentally, the putsch, the attempt to upset Kerensky, proved a failure and cost many workers' lives. The Red Terror instituted by Lenin as soon as he came to power after the October Revolution was bitterly denounced by his co-workers as entirely uncalled for and as a direct betrayal of the revolution. But in spite of official protests of the most active and influential members of the party, Lenin had his way. During the Bresk-Litovsk negotiations, it was again Lenin who insisted that peace on any terms be made with Germany, while Trotsky, Radek, and other important Bolshevik leaders opposed the Kaiser's conditions as humiliating and destructive. Once more, Lenin scored. The new economic policy, the NEP, 
submitted by Lenin to his party during the Kronstadt events was fought by the Central Committee as nullifying all revolutionary achievements and as a death blow to communism. It was indeed a complete reversal of everything the revolution stood for and a return to the very conditions that the Great, Octo Great October change had abolished. But Lenin's will again prevailed and his resolution was carried by the Ninth Communist Congress held in Moscow in March 1921. As you see, the alleged dictatorship of the proletariat was only the dictatorship of Lenin. He dictated to the Politburo, the Politburo to the Central Committee, the Central Committee to the Party, the Party to the Proletariat, and the rest of the people. Russia counted a population of over a hundred millions. The Communist Party had less than 50,000 members. The Central Committee consisted of several score, the Politburo numbered about a dozen, and Lenin was one. But that was the proletarian dictatorship. Russia is a country of vast extent, spread over half of Europe and a goodly part of Asia. It is peopled by numerous races and nationalities speaking different languages, with diversified psychology, varied interests, and outlook on life. We know what the dictatorship of the Tsars did to the country. Let us now see what the proletarian dictatorship accomplished. Today, after over a decade of Bolshevik rule in Russia, we can form a fair estimate of its effects and examine the results it achieved. Let us sum them up. Politically, the aim of the revolution was to abolish government tyranny and oppression and make the people free. The Bolshevik government is admittedly the worst despotism in Europe, with the sole exception of fascist rule in Italy. The citizen has no rights to which the government feels bound to respect. The Communist Party is a political monopoly, with all other parties and movements outlawed. Security of person and domicile is unknown. Freedom of speech and press does not exist. Even within the party, the least difference of opinion is suppressed and punished by imprisonment and exile, as witnessed the fate of Trotsky and his followers of the opposition. Independent opinion is not tolerated. The GPU, the secret service formerly called the Chechka, is a super government with unlimited arbitrary powers over the liberty and lives of the people. Only those who are entirely on the side of the dominant party clique enjoy freedom and privileges. But such liberty is to be had under the worst despotism. If you have nothing to say, you are perfectly free to say it, even in the land of Mussolini. As a prominent member of a recent Communist Congress put it, There is room for all political parties in Russia. The Communist Party is in the government, the others are in prison. Economically, it was the fundamental aim of the revolution to abolish capitalism and establish communism and equality. The Bolshevik dictatorship began by instituting a system of unequal compensation and discriminating rewards and ending by reintroducing capitalistic ownership after it had been abolished by the direct action of the industrial and agrarian proletariat. Today, Russia is a country partly state capitalistic and partly privately capitalistic. The dictatorship and the Red Terror, by which it was maintained, proved the main factors in paralyzing the economic life of the country. High-handed Bolshevik rule antagonized the people. Its despotism embittered the masses. The repression of every independent effort alienated the best elements from the revolution and made them feel that it had become the private concern of the political party in power. Facing a new tyranny, instead of the longed for liberty, the workers became discouraged. They felt their revolutionary achievements taken from them and used as a weapon against themselves and their aspirations. The proletarian saw his factory committee subjugated to the dictates of the communist party and made helpless to protect his interests as a toiler. 
his labor union became the mouthpiece and transmitter of Bolshevik orders, and he found himself deprived of all voice, not only in the management of industry, but even in his own factory, where he was kept at work long hours at the poorest pay. The toilers soon realized that the revolution had been taken out of their hands, that their Soviets had been emasculated of all power, and that the country was being ruled by some people far away in the Kremlin, just as it had been in the days of the Tsars. Eliminated from revolutionary and creative activity, living only to obey the new masters, constantly harassed by the Bolsheviki and Czechists, and ever in fear of prison or execution for the least expression of protest, the worker became embittered against the revolution. He deserted the factory and sought the village where he might be furthest removed from the dreaded rulers and at least secure for his daily bread. Thus broke down the industries of the country. The peasants saw leather-clad and armed communists descend upon his quiet village to spoil it of his fruit of his hard labor and treat him with brutality and insolence of the old Tsarist officials. He saw his Soviet dominated by some lazy good-for-nothing village loafer calling himself Bolshevik and holding power from Moscow. He had willingly, even generously, given his wheat and corn to feed the workers and soldiers but saw his provisions lie rotting at the railroad stations and in the warehouses because the Bolsheviki could not themselves manage things and would let no one else do it. He knew that his brothers in the factory and in the army suffered for lack of food because of communist insufficiency, bureaucracy, and corruption. He understood why more was always demanded of him. He saw his few possessions, his own family provisions, cons confiscated by Czechists, who even took his last horse without which the peasant could neither work nor live. He saw his neighbor villages that rebelled against these outrages leveled to the ground, and the peasants whipped and shot, just as in the old days. He turned against his revolution, and in his desperation, he determined to plant and sow no more that he needed for himself and his family, and to hide even that in the forest. Such were the results of the dictatorship of Lenin's military communism and Bolshevik methods. Industry stood still, and famine overwhelmed the country. The general suffering, the bitterness of the workers, the peasant uprisings, began to threaten the very existence of the Bolshevik regime. To save the dictatorship, Lenin needed to introduce a new economic policy, known as the NEP. The purpose of the NEP, also known as the NEP, was to revive the economic life of the country. It was to encourage greater production by the peasantry by allowing them to sell their surplus instead of having it forcibly confiscated by the government. It was also to, to enable exchanges of products by legalizing trade and reviving the cooperatives formerly suppressed as counter-revolutionary. But the determination of the Communist Party to hold on to its dictatorship made all these economic reforms ineffectual because industry cannot develop under a despotic regime. Economic growth, as well as trade and commerce, requires security of person and property, a certain amount of freedom and non-interference in order to function. But dictatorship does not permit that freedom. Its guarantees cannot inspire confidence. Hence, the new economic policy has not produced the results desired and Russia remains in the throes of poverty, constantly on the brink of economic disaster. Industrially, the dictatorship has emasculated the revolution of its basic purpose of placing production in the hands of the proletariat and making the worker independent of economic masters. The dictatorship merely changed masters. The government has become the boss instead of the individual capitalist though the latter is now also developing a new class in Russia. The toiler has remained dependent as before, in fact, more so. His labor organizations have been deprived of all power, 
and he has lost even the right to strike against his government or governmental employer. Since the workers as a class wield the dictatorship, the communists argue, they cannot strike against themselves. Accordingly, the proletarians in Russia pay themselves wages that are not sufficient for bare existence, live in crowded, unhygienic quarters, work under the most unsanitary conditions, endanger their healths and lives because of the lack of industrial protection and safety, and arrest and imprison themselves for an expression of discontent. Culturally, the Bolshevik regime is a training school in communism and party fanaticism, with no access to ideas differing from the views of the dominant clique. It is the rearing of an entire people in the dogmas of a political church, with no opportunity to broaden and cultivate the mind outside the circle of opinions permitted by the ruling class. No press exists in Russia except the official communist publications, and such others that are approved by the Bolshevik censor. No public sentiment can find expression there, since government has a monopoly on speech, press, and assembly. It is no exaggeration to say that there is less freedom of opinion and opportunity to, vo to voice it under the Bolshevik dictatorship than there have, had been under the Tsars. When Russia was ruled by the Romanovs, you could at least secretly issue pamphlets and books, since the government then had no monopoly on the paper supply and printing presses. These were in private hands, and the revolutionists could always find a way to use them for propaganda. Today in Russia, all the means of publication and distribution are in the exclusive possession of the government, and no person can express his views to the public unless he first secures Bolshevik permission. Thousands of illegal publications had been issued by the revolutionary parties during the autocratic Romanov regime. Under communist rule, such a happening is most exceptional, as witness the indignant amazement of the Bolsheviki when it was discovered that Trotsky had succeeded in publishing the platform of the opposition element in the party. Socially, Bolshevik Russia, ten years after the revolution, is a country where no man can enjoy his political security or economic independence, where the hidden hand of the GPU is always at work, terrorizing the people by sudden night searches, arrests for no cause, secret denunciation for alleged counter-revolution out of personal revenge, imprisonment without hearing or trial, and year-long exile to the frozen north of Siberia or to the wastes of Western Asia. A huge prison where equality means the fear of all alike and freedom signifies unquestioning submission to the powers that be. Morally, Russia represents the struggle of the finer qualities of man against the degrading and corrupting elements of a system built on coercion and intimidation. The revolution brought the best instincts of man to the fore, his manhood, his consciousness of human value, his love of liberty and justice, the revolutionary atmosphere inspired and cultivated these tendencies lying dormant in the people, particularly in the feeling against oppression, the hunger for freedom, the spirit of mutual helpfulness and cooperation. But the dictatorship has had the effect of counteracting these traits, arousing instead fear and hatred, the spirit of intolerance and persecution. Bolshevik methods have systematically weakened the people's morale, have encouraged servility and hypocrisy, have created disillusionment and distrust, have developed an atmosphere of time-serving now dominant in Russia. Such is the situation today in that unhappy land. Such the effects of that Bolshevik idea that you can make people free by compulsion, the dogma that dictatorship can lead to liberty. So you think the Ref Russian Revolution failed because of dictatorship, you ask? Was not Russia too backward to make a success of it? It failed because of Bolshevik ideas and methods. The Russian masses were not too backward to abolish the Tsar, to defeat the provisional government, to destroy capitalism and the wage system, to turn the land over to the peasantry and the industries to the workers. 
So far, the revolution was the greatest success, and the people were beginning to be build a new life built upon the foundation of equal liberty, opportunity, and justice. But the moment a political party usurped the reins of government and proclaimed its dictatorship, disastrous results were inevitable. Revolution, when it comes, must deal with the conditions as it finds them. It is the means and methods used, and the purpose for which they are used, that are vital. Upon them depends the course and fate of the revolution. Let us learn this lesson well, because the fate of revolution depends on it. You shall reap what you sow, is the acme of all human wisdom and experience. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.